thank you so much for allowing me to be here. And Sherry's right, often when I go to groups, um, traditionally I used to speak to students a lot, and so I would get up in my blue FFA jacket and speak to students. But it's more enjoyable for me, most of the time, to speak to uh, the older generation because uh, I usually get some funny looks. Because first of all, people wonder, okay, you're a girl, that's true. And you're also young, which is also true. And many of you in here are probably wondering what I actually know about agriculture. And uh, most of you have probably been in the agricultural industry and farming out on your family farms for maybe three times the amount of time that I have actually been alive. And I commend you for that. Um, and I'm gonna confuse you a little bit further because I actually did not grow up on a farm. And where I'm from in Ohio, it, we, it has a town name, but a lot of people refer to it as Podunk because it is a small town, but I had a feeling when I came here that I wouldn't necessarily be surrounded by folks that thought that it was a podunk small town. So I'm gonna do a little survey here, okay? So normally when I go to speak, I am from the smallest town in the room, but I feel like that's probably not the case here. So Podunk, Ohio, also known as Dronesville, has one stoplight, a general store, where my father has a tab, and I have never once taken cash with me, ever. Ever. But that tab's getting kind of long, and I think he's getting suspicious. And a gas station that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. And the population currently is 452 people. I had a feeling that this was the case. So we're gonna do a show of hands here because I need to do a survey. So a show of hands, who is from a town of 450 or less? Okay, and then keep your hands up, 350 or less? 250? 150? 50? 25? I could become an auctioneer. 10? Who is the only person that lives in their town? <laughs> I had a feeling that that was the case here, but normally when I go and I say 450, people go, oh my gosh, how did you survive? There was nobody there. And that's not including livestock, so once you count them in, it gets a little bit bigger, normally. But no, I did not grow up on a farm. I did grow up in a very rural community for um, the state of Ohio and surrounded by farming my whole life. And my mother grew up on a family farm that actually was sold off and lotted into a housing development because none of the three girls in her family wanted to continue farming. And when they all married off, all the husbands said, meh, I didn't marry into this. Especially my father, who had no farming experience whatsoever. And so growing up, I watched all my friends be on the farm, and I claimed that I was practically raised on one because my best friend had a pulled Hereford operation. And so I spent a lot of time in the hayloft, saving kittens, um, throwing things at her sister from the hayloft, which got us in a little bit of trouble. Uh, but that was my only experience. And so when I got about 10 years old, I decided that I wanted to be a little more involved. I had been in 4-H, but I could only take sh sewing projects and woodworking, and it was getting kind of boring. So I went to my dad with a proposal written out that said, okay, I want to show an animal at the fair, dad. And he said, Hannah, we're not buying a steer. We live on three acres. It's not going to happen. And I said, that's okay, I don't want a steer. I want a rabbit. Okay, I'll put it in the backyard, I promise I'll take care of it, I won't let it die, and I can take it to the fair and show with the rest of my friends. And he said, eh, not, not big on rabbits, let me see if I can come up with something better. Two days later, dad drives in, and in the back of the pickup truck is my younger brother holding two market lambs. And that's where we started. We built a little shed out back, but dad and I, which then turned into a pole barn in later years. Uh, my brother kind of joined in with us, raising market lambs, and we added market hogs to the mix. And that was our personal farm operation from May to November. And the rest of the year, the barn sat empty. But to me, showing livestock was more than just a sport. It was more than just getting to show at the county fair. And it sparked that love of agriculture for me because it was the first time that I could ever remember my family all doing the same thing at the same time for the same cause. And every Sunday became the day that all four of us would be out in the barn cleaning, washing and shearing lambs, washing hogs, walking lambs, cleaning the pens, doing whatever else was needed, but all four of us were together. 
doing the same thing. And it showed me that agriculture was a family sport. And so I vowed that no matter what I did from then on out, it had to involve agriculture so that my family could all be together and be involved. And many of you know the same feeling based on your family farms or your experiences in agriculture, but that was my first love and my first passion came from that experience of bringing my family together. Now, I have had the opportunity to serve in FFA, as Sherry mentioned, and during my year as a national officer, I had the chance to travel about 140,000 miles in one year, 40 states. Um, typically, I was on the road, I think that year I totaled about 324 days on the road away from my family, traveling, talking about agriculture, agricultural education in the FFA. And when you're traveling, as many of you know, you meet some pretty interesting people, especially in airports. And my favorite sport is people watching. And so I would sit there and I would watch people and I would always try to guess who I would have to sit next to on the plane. And some of them were extremely nice. They came from other industries. We'd talk about their families. I'd get to hear all about the grandkids every time which I loved, it was so funny. Sometimes those pictures would roll out and they'd be 10 deep and I'd hear the life story of every single one of them. And I always enjoyed those trips so much. But one that stands out in my memory in a not so positive way uh, was a flight from Chicago here to Atlanta. And uh, I sat down on the plane and I got my book out and I was ready to go. And the gentleman sits next to me in a very vibrant Hawaiian floral shirt. And so we kind of go through the normal hodgepodge of introducing each other. Where are you from? What do you do? Business or pleasure? And, um, you know, where are you headed? And so he told me that he was on his way to Key West. They owned some property there, he and his wife. He was involved in real estate and was basically filthy rich. And so he was headed to Key West for the entire summer to spend there with his wife. And, and that was what he did. All of his children were grown. And so then I started in on my spiel. Well, I'm involved in agriculture, and I want to teach agricultural education, and I'm involved with FFA, which is a student organization based in agricultural education, and the list goes on. And he kind of gave me a funny look, and I, I really didn't know what to expect. And he kind of turned toward me, and he said, let me tell you something, which are never words that are good. And he said, young lady, agriculture, is dead. And I kind of had the same reaction that I saw out there, a little taken aback. And I said, excuse me? And he said, agriculture is a dying industry. Why on earth would you want to be involved in that? And so I'm already planning my rebuttal, sitting there thinking over the facts that I want to share with him, like it's the number one industry in the world, that there's half a million students studying agricultural education, that there's over 300 different careers in agriculture, and that a majority of the workforce in America is involved in agriculture in some way, shape, or form, and that the awful shirt he's wearing is also from agriculture <laughs> but I didn't get a chance to because as soon as I opened my mouth to speak and to defend myself he put his hand in my face and said no listen and he said you will never make any money in agriculture it's a dying industry why on earth would you want to be involved in the agriculture industry only stupid people would want to become agriculturalists or do something in the agriculture industry he said if you want to make money young lady you need to go into real estate well i'd had just about enough of that and so i started to talk again and again i got a hand in my face and after about a half an hour of trying to educate this gentleman about what agriculture is and what it does, I finally gave up, which I don't do very often. And I put on my iPod and I turned away from him and politely ignored him for the rest of the flight. And it absolutely broke my heart and boiled my blood like you wouldn't believe. And when I got off the plane, I called my mom and I said, Mom, you will not believe what this man just said to me. And my mom's response was, Hannah, not everybody loves agriculture or understands agriculture the way that you do. And it makes me so appreciative of groups like this. Because there is a, an epidemic right now that is more rapid and more advanced than any flu or virus that we've ever seen. And it's people that are not educated about where their food comes from, 
how their clothes are produced, or how their homes are built. And it is a terrible epidemic. But we all are doing something about it, which is pretty amazing. And I love getting the chance to speak to groups that are truly passionate and truly understand and truly love agriculture like this group does. Now, when Sherry first contacted me to speak, I had not heard of Farm Rescue before. Being all the way from Ohio, I had not uh, experienced it at all. So immediately jumped on the website, started reading the articles, started researching what this organization was all about. And two major things jumped out to me from the very beginning. And the first is that you were truly encouraging the next generation which is what I strive to do when I'm out working with students, and right now I'm actually student teaching, and so uh, I get to work with young people every day that are interested in agriculture. And it's a blessing and sometimes a struggle for me uh, when students aren't interested in something or they think it's silly that we have to learn about soils, but it truly is interesting to see this next generation. However, when I tell other ag teachers sometimes that I want to be an ag teacher instead of doing anything else in the world, they say, why on earth would you want to do that? There's no money. Do you want a family? Do you want kids? Don't become an ag teacher. You don't have time for that. I hate my job. And I think, man, I would kill to have your job. I would love to be getting paid right now for the work that I'm doing in the classroom. But even if I wasn't, and I'm not right now, I love what I do. And as farmers, sometimes that same message is sent across. It's too much work, it's too hard, there's no money, it's too much of a struggle. Don't stay on the farm. And then you all come into the picture and say, Please stay on the farm. And if something happens, God forbid, we're here. We're here to lend a helping hand, and we are going to support you no matter what. You have an ally out there. And that's something that we just don't hear often enough. It's such an encouragement for me to be in a group like this that truly is inspiring the next generation. And it's kind of funny, I have a student in my classroom, his name is Trey, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with Justin Bieber, the pop star, but Trey kind of looks like Justin Bieber, if you can picture it. He's got the long hair, he's super skinny and scrawny, he wears the tight jeans and the skater shoes, uh, but Trey is extremely smart. And Trey actually took his ACT this summer. And I said, Trey, I heard you did pretty well on your ACT. Now, the top score is a 36. Trey, from his sophomore to his junior year, that during this past summer, scored a 32 on the ACT, which is a feat in itself. However, when I talked to Trey about it, I said, you know, you did really well. That was, that's pretty amazing. And he said, yeah, but I think I could have done better. And I said, better, Trey? And he said, yeah, I didn't take a calculator. He did the entire math portion and scored a 34 on the math portion of the ACT with no calculator. And if you ask Trey what he wants to do with his life, and he's had college scholarships already offered to him as a junior in high school, Trey wants to farm. Because a local farmer heard that he was interested took him under his wing, and Trey's not from a farm either. His uh, family, his father died when he was very, very young. His mother has struggled to support the family. And uh, the farmer took him under his wing, and he's been working with him all summer. And Trey is convinced that no matter how many scholarships that he has, that he'll go and study agriculture at an agricultural school because he wants to farm, fostering that next generation. That's what you all do every time you walk into somebody's property or walk into their home and help them. You're fostering that generation and that hope that there is something to look forward to and that agriculture is not dead, as so uh, told by this gentleman on the plane. The other thing that I noticed about your website that really jumped out to me was that there was a phrase on the front page that said, selfless acts, selfless people. Selfless acts, selfless people. That type of servant leadership is so dearly needed that it's unbelievable. A lot of folks don't know what it's like to have somebody come out and help them and not expect anything in return. 
And that's exactly what you do. A farmer in my local community um, several, several years ago was having a lot of trouble. His, he and his brother farmed together and his brother had just been diagnosed with cancer, was starting to undergo chemotherapy, and they just found out that the farm was going to have to file for bankruptcy. And this was back in 1988. And at that time, he and his wife were trying to run the farm by themselves. And in the last eight years, they had just had seven children. In 88, they decided that, they, yes, they were going to have to file for bankruptcy because they just couldn't do it on their own. And the amount of community support that poured in and that came through to the farm actually afforded enough for them to have seven fully paid college scholarships for the boys once they graduated high school and decided to go to college. And it saved the farm. Now the reason I know that story is that the youngest um, of those seven at that time, and then now there's currently nine children in the family, eight boys and one girl, uh, is actually my boyfriend. And I have watched this farm just flourish and grow. And now they have 5,000 acres. They farm full time. Every single boy in the family and the daughter all have college degrees in something other than agriculture, and all of them are still on the farm. Nine children still farming in our community. And on Labor Day, they just had a huge barbecue for everyone. And it was really interesting to see the entire community come together. And a lot of the old farmers were talking about, yeah, I remember when I brought over my truck and hauled that grain for you that year. Because I knew it, that you guys needed the help. And the neat thing about Farm Rescue is that you're providing that avenue. And if our community hadn't have known the family that well, it never would have survived. There wouldn't be Kamenek Brothers Farms anymore. And the farms that they've fostered since then and helped out since then, they just keep paying it forward and paying it forward and paying it forward. So not only do you spark it and you provide this avenue for businesses and volunteers and people to come together and help farmers, but then you also start this fire that just continues. And I'm sure as volunteers, once you've gone to one, you want to go to another and another and another. And it's just amazing the type of impact that you can have. It's so motivating to be here with all of you and to listen to your stories. And I've already wiped some tears away. And I'm sure that I'm going to need a tissue by the time I get done tonight. And I'm so thankful to know that there's organizations like this out here that are fighting for the same things that I hold so dearly. I am honored to be here and to have the chance to meet all of you and hear your stories and listen to you. And I am just very, very thankful for what you do. And know that I will be taking all this information back to Ohio with me. And I've already kind of poked Bill for things that I can take back and things that I can try to start working on in our state. Because even folks that I talked to wanted to know, how do we get an organization like that? How can we help? What can we do from states away? People want to know how they can contribute to this organization. So I intend on taking a lot of information back with me. But thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you do. Thank you for allowing me to be here. And please keep up the good work. Thank you.